Remember that old Moody Blues song, uh, Nice White Satin? Mm. Breathe deep together. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I'm real nervous, it's like take a couple of deep breaths and everything's great. Just <laughs> catch your breath. Folks, it's, a, it's an honor to be asked, uh, when Joan asked me if I would uh, be part of the program today to speak to you all about telescopes and mounds. Astronomy is one of my lifelong passions. I remember, uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit about the story as we go here, but I remember the fascination the first time I racked in the moon in my telescope and just exploring another world from one's backyard and how just incredible that feeling was. Uh, just me, my telescope, and another world. And that sensation is one that revisits me every time I look through an eyepiece of a telescope into the cosmos. It never goes away. That, uh, that newness is always, always there in astronomy. So let me go ahead and get started with my presentation tonight. I'm going to ask you to hold your questions until the end because frankly, I don't think there's gonna be any time for them. However, at the end, I have a copy of my whole slide deck for anybody who wants one. And my contact information is in here as well. And I'd be happy to ask, uh, you know, answer any questions you might have. Okay, what's a telescope? Well, when we want to find out the definition of something, we usually go to a dictionary. Uh, Marion Webster, uh, the trusted uh, dictionary for decades and decades, and then Wikipedia. So here's how they define a telescope. A tubular instrument for viewing distant objects as objects in outer space by focusing light rays with mirrors or lenses. That's really a pretty good definition of a telescope. A telescope is a device used to observe distant objects by their emission, absorption, or reflection of electromagnetic radiation. That's a little bit deeper definition, but is also very correct. A little bit of history. And I find this fascinating, and the reason I do is because I'm a person who wears glasses. Anybody in here have to wear corrective lenses of one type or another? Well, the science of optics for a long time really revolved around how can people who can't see anymore see? And so spectacle making became a huge business. And the first telescopes were actually the offshoot of experiments done by some uh, Danish uh, spectacle makers. Uh, Hans Lippershey, and Zacharias Jansen, and then also another company in the Netherlands at the same time by Jacob Medias. And these people were the first ones who created a telescope. Well, it wasn't long before Galileo, the great polymath, found out about this new, they called it a Danish perspective glass. And so being the bright guy that he was, he created his own telescope in 1609, and he pointed at the heavens, and as they say, the rest is history. Okay, so that we can go into a lot more history, but that's kind of the, the genesis in a nutshell. Telescope design innovations. First we had the refractor and very crude chromatic lens at the time. And uh, then we got reflectors and there were two varieties. The first one was created by Laurent Cassegrain and uh, that was in uh, 1672, I believe. And then the Newtonian reflector. Now, as with Newton, there's always speculation, well, Isaac Newton did it first. Same thing with calculus and Leibniz, but uh, the, the thing of it is, is it says, uh, Newton might have been thinking about a Newtonian reflector somewhere around 1668, but he did make a prototype for a number of years. So we're gonna let Cassegrain take the first seat here, and then the Newtonian reflector comes along. Catadioptric, which means the uh, main objective is a combination of both lenses and mirrors, uh, that came along uh, in the uh, 20th century. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get to it in the presentation. Now, I know some people love math like me, and there are some people who, mm, not so much. But it's very, important that you understand a few basic things about math when it comes to optics because it will help you appreciate telescopes in general and probably more importantly if you're thinking about ever purchasing a telescope you'll be able to make a more informed decision about the kind of telescope you buy i'm going to keep it very very basic here and not because i'm trying to talk down to you 
It's only because I know that some of you don't really appreciate and love the math aspect of astronomy like me and some other people do. Contrary to popular opinion, magnification is not the most important number when it comes to a telescope. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you ran into this when you were looking for your first telescope. Magnifies 300 times. And you're thinking, ooh, that's kind of the one I want. Well, when we get to magnification, we'll talk about the term useful magnification. You can magnify anything you want as big as you want, but useful is the operative term here, right? The most important number when it comes to telescopes is light gathering power. And that is a function of the diameter of the main objective, be it a mirror or a lens. So what we do is we have a very simple formula here to figure out how much light gathering power a telescope has. We compare it to a fully dark adapted human eye. Now when you go to a star party, they tell you to turn your car lights off. Because how long does it take the human eye to dark adapt? Yeah, and you know, any little thing that comes up blows that, and then what you have to do? Then you gotta do it again, right? And so people get really, really testy when you come in there with your brights fully on into a star party. Uh, yeah, don't do that. So about seven millimeters is the diameter of a fully. How long does it take to get that? About 20 minutes, yeah. And it probably differs a little bit with each person. And actually the, you know, the, the darkness of the sky at that point. But seven millimeters is kind of the general accepted diameter of a fully dilated human eye. Okay, the aperture of the objective in millimeters, very simple formula. The aperture of the objective divided by the uh, aperture of a dark adaptive human eye, which is seven millimeters, squared. And using my 80 millimeter refractor, divided by a fully dilated human eye, squared, my little 80 millimeter refractor that I'll show you in a bit, has 130 times the light gathering power of one human eye. And that's a little telescope. So you start understanding, uh, you know, the power of these big, huge mirrors that some of us have in our telescopes, and why the objects look so incredibly beautiful. It's because of their light gathering power, not their magnification. Focal ratio, this is the next number we need to talk about. It's the F number. Uh, how many of you are in for photography? So you know, you sit there and you stop down the F or up there or whatever, looking for depth of field. Well, F number stands for the same kind of a thing when you're talking about astronomy. Focal length determined by the design of the objective elements is capital F. The objective diameter, again, is capital D. The formula is F divided by D, so back to my 60, uh, 80 millimeter refractor. 600 millimeter focal length divided by the 80 millimeter diameter gives my little 80 millimeter refractor an F ratio of 7.5. And as you'll see here in a bit, that is literally straddling the line between what's called a fast optical system and a slower optical system. I want to talk a little bit more about the uh, focal ratios. Longer focal ratios, F8 and higher, they produce a little bit more magnification at the focal point and narrower fields of view with any given eyepiece. This is important to remember. Shorter focal ratios, F7 and less, they produce lower magnifications uh, and wider fields of view with any given eyepiece. Shorter focal ratios increase the brightness of extended objects. Those are the distant galaxies, the little fuzzies we talk about in amateur astronomy. For example, an F5 telescope will show an image four times brighter than an F10 telescope, and it's only half as big. This is a very important note. Brightness of point sources like stars is completely contingent on the aperture of the objective. Okay, let's talk about magnification. This is what everybody talks about when they want to get a telescope. Focal length of the objective, big F, divided by uh, the focal length of the eyepiece, which is little f. So back to my 80 millimeter refractor. 600 millimeter focal length 
Let's say I take a 25 millimeter eyepiece. So 600 divided by 25, that would give me 24 times magnification. Now, here's a little question for you seasoned astronomers out there. What is the theoretical useful, magnif max, uh, useful magnification per inch of aperture? It's 50. It's 50 times per inch of aperture. So my 80 millimeter refractor is basically a three inch uh, telescope. So 150 would be really the useful high magnification number for an 80 millimeter refractor. Now, will it magnify more than that? Yes. Oh yeah, you stick a three times Barlow in there and a four a millimeter orthoscopic and it'll, it'll give you a really, really big, but you won't see anything. Okay, let's talk about refractors. There is my first little refractor my parents gave me when I was 12 years old. Here is the diagram of how a refractor works. It comes through the main objective, which is a lens. And it travels down to the focal point, which uh, is usually has a, a movable eyepiece there so that it can be uh, adjusted for any particular viewer's eyesight. This is a refracting telescope. In fact, this is the telescope that my parents gave me when I turned 12 years old. This is the little instrument that got me started with astronomy all those years ago. Very simple, the light comes in the top here, it comes down to a focus point, and then you can focus for your eye here. As simple as this is, it's far superior to the first refractors that were created uh, back in the day. Okay, I just stated in there, this was actually a 40 millimeter refractor. But I'll tell you what, Galileo would have probably given his eye teeth for that little Pasco reading. See, we don't realize how lucky we are to live when we do when it comes to astronomy and telescopes. Okay, here is my Celestron ADED. ED stands for Extra Low Dispersion Glass that corrects for optical defects when lenses are the primary objective. This is my uh, 80 millimeter Celestron refractor. This is the unit that I take everywhere to uh, go remotely and do astrophotography. Again, refractor design. Light goes down the front, comes to the focal point here. In this case, it's on the uh, uh, sensor of the DSLR camera I have here. And it's just a wonderful little setup. Okay, every single telescope design, including refractors, have pros and cons. And it's very important for you, especially when you're looking to purchase your first telescope, to be aware of what those are. So here are the pros, and by the way, these are not exhaustive lists. These are samplings of pros and cons. Refractors do not need to be collimated. Uh, one of our speakers today is actually gonna show you how to collimate a telescope. And uh, for instance, when I get my big Dobsonian out, I have to collimate it every single time I use it because even the slightest bump takes those fast optics out of collimation. Nothing is obstructing the optical path. There is no secondary mirror like a Newtonian or a Cassegrain. It's clear aperture. People say, why do the images look so crisp and black? That's because of the optical design of a refractor. Color correction is good in achromatic designs. That basically means a two lens system in front rather than a chromatic or a one lens system. An acromat is basically two lenses. And if, if, if you use some of the modern uh, technology and, and uh, optical designs, like using ED glass, fluoride coatings, and apochromatic lens systems, which are basically three lenses up front, it basically can correct most or all of the color uh, uh, aberrations that come from using lenses. They offer wide fields of view in the faster F number scopes. There's less cleaning and maintenance because a refractor tube is sealed. The dirt and debris do not get inside of the optical assembly. And here's a really big thing if you plan on using your refractor for both terrestrial and celestial. With a correcting prism, it shows a right side up, right orientated image. 
which is not the case with some of these other designs. Okay, here's some cons. Refractors are the most expensive telescope per inch of aperture. Doesn't even come close. If any of you have tried to price like a five inch apochromatic refractor, I hope you were sitting down when you were looking at the prices. <laughs> You know, I could buy myself a C14 for that, you know. Chromatic aberration is present in the simpler designs. I already talked about that. It can be addressed by more complex lens systems. But again, with those more complex apochromatic designs, the cost soars, especially with bigger uh, uh, diameter objectives. Large diameter refractors are long and heavy. And to be honest with you, most of the refractors used today by amateurs are smaller. Okay, most of them probably, you know, 80 to 150 millimeters, somewhere in there. Reflectors, here are a picture of all the reflectors I've owned in my life. The first one was the old RV6 Dynascope. I don't know, if anybody here around an RV6 back in the 1970s? Okay, yeah, I wish I had kept that because it's probably a collector's item right now. There's my big uh, Dobsonian. Um, I had a, an Odyssey uh, 10 inch there at one time. And I had a Schmidt uh, Newtonian in my observatory at one point. Okay, the first uh, reflector design was uh, created by Laurent Cassegrain. And what uh, he conceived does was, you know, it's, you know, some of these telescopes are getting really long. Is there a way to fold the optical path? Well, a Gregorian reflector had been created before to have a hole in the middle of the mirror and folded the optical. And so he improved on that design, came up with the Cassegrain design. Here is the last major telescope on Earth to use the classical Cassegrain design with a parabolic mirror. In fact, at the time this was being built, there was argument whether to come in with an RC or a Ritchie Creek Inn telescope, uh, but there was some politics and stuff involved, so this ended up being a parabolic mirror Cassegrain telescope. Not that it's bad, it just could have been better. How many of you have been to Mount Palomar? That's really a fun experience uh, for those of you that's wrong. There's my little family down there, back of the building. Okay, here's the Newtonian reflector. This is uh, a Newtonian reflector here that's gonna be talked about later, I'm sure. And a very elegant design created by Isaac Newton. Again, some of the material says that he conceived of this actually before Cassegrain conceived of the Cassegrain. But like some things Newton did, he supposedly conceived it and didn't publish it until decades later. So we don't know. I'm not trying to make fun of Isaac Newton. He's one of the most brilliant people who's ever lived. But it is funny how he wants to give their, people want to give him credit for a lot of things. Okay. Well, here I am with a Newtonian reflector, quite a big one. This is 16 inches, uh, f4.5, very fast optics. This one happens to be mounted in a Dobsonian rocker box, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But uh, let's just go ahead and take a look at the classical Newtonian design here. It has a mirror for the main objective, uh, a parabola. It reflects a cone back up the tube to this flat secondary here, which then directs a smaller cone out to the eyepiece assembly have a nice dual speed Crayford style focuser here for the eyepiece. Very elegant design, still used today. And when you take this to a dark sky site, <laughs> you have incredible views of the real faint uh, galaxies out in the sky. It's a joy to look at myself, and it's also a joy to show other people. A couple of accessories here. I also have a Telrad zero power finder which projects a red target onto the sky four degree circle and you can use that to st star hop around to different things and then I have a 10 by 50 finder here that has a correct uh, orientation view for fine tuning in on objects and then finally the eyepiece here incredibly great telescope for deep sky observing okay uh, here's the Ritchie Krakian telescope design that was actually conceived by George Willis Ritchie and uh, uh, what's his name? Henri Krakian in the 1910s. 
And this is really the pinnacle of castle crane design in today's world. Uh, some of you have heard of Plane Wave, the company Plane Wave. They build RC telescopes. Uh, in fact, here is an RC telescope. How many of you have been to Kick Peak? Okay, the giant mile reflector, four meter up there is uh, an RC reflector, as are most of the telescopes on the top of Mauna Kea. Pros of reflectors. Newtonian reflectors cost less per inch of aperture than refractors and catadioptrics. Chromatic aberration from traveling through lenses is not present in a reflector. Cast grain reflectors can be very compact and portable. And Newtonian reflectors with large mirrors and short focal lengths are just a delight to look at these type objects through. And lastly, eyepiece placement for a Newtonian can be uh, a lot more comfortable. Cons, regular collimations required, we talked about that. Secondary mirrors block the light, part of the light path coming in, and the supporting structure of the secondary create the fraction spikes, those long lines you see on the stars in the picture from big uh, observatories. Um, they're really not uh, very good for terrestrial viewing because the image is upside down and backwards. And they can be bulky above eight inches. That's an eight inch uh, uh, Newtonian right there. Okay, catadioptrics. Lenses, mirrors gather and focus the light. There's all my uh, uh, catadioptrics I've had over the year. Uh, anybody recognize that picture up there? <laughs> That's the original grim. That is the original spot. Uh, grim. Yeah, the grim reflector there in the, in the dome out of spot before the spot walk even existed out there. Schmidt cast brain design. What happened is a guy uh, looked at the Schmidt uh, camera that had been created by Bernard Schmidt, and this guy's name was James, uh, uh, let's see, James Gilbert, uh, James Gilbert something or other. But in 1940, he could see, but let's take this great Schmidt camera design and, and create a Cassegrain out of it by perforating the main uh, mirror. And thus the Schmidt Cassegrain uh, telescope was born at that time. His name was James uh, Gilbert Baker. Man's name. Maxutov Cassegrain was uh, patented in 1941 by Dmitri Maxutov, and we'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of these events. Well, welcome to Pleasant Valley Observatory. This is my observatory in my backyard that I designed and built. And the main instrument in here is a Schmidt Cassegrain, which I'll show you in just a second. It is also computer controlled so that I can control the guiding, the telescope, and the camera all from my desk here instead of having to sit up on the observing platform here. But let me show you my telescope. Here's my main instrument, the 8 inch Schmidt Cassegrain. As you can see, it has the Schmidt corrector plate. That's the first uh, thing that the light path encounters. It corrects for spherical aberration of the mirrors that are the main objective at the bottom of the tube. So it goes through the corrector plate, hits the main mirror at the bottom, and then it bounces back up to that secondary. And in the case of my Schmidt cast grain, it's a hyperbola, which further reduces optical errors. And then it passes it toward the back of the telescope, and I'll show you that next. Here's the back of my Schmidt Cassegrain. Uh, you can see I have an electric focuser there, and then I have a diagonal, and then an eyepiece. I have a mirror lock knob on top to keep uh, the mirror from flopping during photography, and I have the main uh, focus knob there, the long one. On top, let's get up on top of my platform here, I again have a tail rad zero power finder on top, riding on a Lozman D mount. And then again, I have a correct view or orientation uh, 50 millimeter finder on there. So again, I, if I'm just hopping around, I use the tail rad first, the finder second, and then the, uh, the eyepiece third. And uh, just while we're on eyepieces really quickly, uh, you know, most of us uh, amateur astronomers collect a number of eyepieces of different focal lengths uh, over our careers so that we can 
enjoy objects under different magnification. Okay, pros of cats. They're compact and easy uh, to, or to uh, transport around. Now, I say that with a caveat. Uh, you know, the big 14 and 16 inch ones, they, <laughs> they, they kind of, uh, you know, when it comes to portability, I'll let you be the judge of how portable that really is. Uh, Max tops can be permanently collimated and sealed, so they never need to be collimated. Some people consider an SCT or Schmidt cast screen to be the best all around telescope design simply because of its versatility. Many of the newer models of Schmidt cast grains are designed with, with their optical systems that are virtually aberration free. They are really getting fun to look through. Some cons, they're more expensive than Newtonians at the same aperture. Maxitos can take more time to equalize temperature-wise because of the thick meniscus lens in the front of the telescope. Uh, SCTs require periodic collimation of the secondary, and uh, coma and field curvature can be issues because of the spherical mirrors, depending on the sophistication of the optical train. Okay, let's talk about telescope mounts. There are basically two kinds of telescope mounts, altazimuth mounts and equatorial mounts. When it comes to an altazimuth mount, probably the one we're most familiar with is a photo tripod. This telescope is mounted on a simple altitude azimuth mount. And so as you can see, it turns in azimuth. Azimuth is simply in the horizontal plane here, or around and around and around is the way we would put it. And it also goes up and down. So hence altitude azimuth. I want to talk a little bit more about the Dobsonian version of an altitude azimuth mount. This was invented by John Dobson in 1956. I have uh, rebuilt the rocker box. The original one was made out of particle board and uh, after a couple of years it started absorbing moisture and just fell apart. I remade the rocker box out of marine grade plywood and sealed it up really good. But as you can see, like all altitude azimuth mounts, the azimuth, get that handle down out of the way, the azimuth turns round and round, and the altitude goes up and down. Very easy to maneuver around the sky and look at what you want. In fact, one of the jokes with those of us who have learned the night sky and have Dobsonians is we can often find uh, the Messier objects, the more popular ones, faster with our Dobsonians than somebody with a computerized go-to telescope. By the time they look up the object, punch it in, and hit slew, we're already there looking at it. It's kind of fun. Uh, one of the benefits of spending the time to get to know the night sky. How many of you would agree with that? Kind of fun, isn't it? It pays to learn the night sky. Pros about azimuth mounts, obviously they're very inexpensive. Uh, they're much easier to set up, and they're intuitive in design and easy to operate. I mean, those are good things. There's a reason that a lot of people buy these. Cons. It can be very hard to find objects if you don't know the night sky. And I would suggest that you get yourself a really good uh, pocket atlas. I know I'm not, I don't get, I don't get any kind of a, <laughs> a commission for this, but this is my favorite star atlas made by uh, Sky and Telescope. Um, I've never found one better than this. It's the one I take with me when I have my dog. And what I've done is I've created, I've created little clear templates uh, that match the Telrad's fields of view that I can put on my little uh, atlases here and easily see how many things I have to jump over to see. It's kind of fun, it's like a treasure hunt finding DSOs with the dog. Equatorial mounts. Uh, we're going to talk about two varieties, the German equatorial mount or the gem, and a fork mount on an equatorial wedge, such as a schmidt cassidy We're back here again with the uh, 80 millimeter Celestron. It is on a Skywatcher HEQ5 Pro mount, which is a German equatorial mount. And basically that means that the telescope is directed right to the pivot point of the declination axis, which forms a T 
and it comes down here and it has a weight to count, counterbalance the telescope with. And so what uh, equatorial mount does is it takes what we would call the azimuth plane and it tilts it to the latitude of the observer. Because we live on a sphere, the objects in the sky as our planet turns describe arcs across the sky. And the equatorial mount allows you to track in those perfect arcs. Okay, so this again would be the azimuth plane raised to a latitude, and then the altitude is this axis here. Now it's a little deceiving here because it doesn't look like it's doing much altitude, but if I do the RA axis down like that, then you can see the declination, it's called axis, is what would be analogous to the altitude axis on an alt azimuth mount. Now the cool part about this is that it is controlled by my computer and so if I come over here I got, wanted to demonstrate this a little bit uh, the go-to capabilities of modern computerized uh, telescopes whether they're in an altitude azimuth uh, configuration, like many popular schmidt cassegrains now, or whether they're in an equatorial configuration, as my HEQ5 Pro mount here, is completely controlled from my computer. The telescope, the camera, the guide scope, and it's all through one USB 3 cable here to my computer. Uh, it's for example, I'll just move it around a little bit so you can see it. pretty cool age we live in where everything uh, can be computerized like this and it uh, actually makes it possible to take pictures now through amateur telescopes that rival those taken by major observatories decades ago. So pretty cool. I wanted to show you the mount on my observatory telescope here because it is another variation of an equatorial mount. Most Schmidt Cassegrains come mounted on a, a field tripod with a flat top and they move in azimuth and altitude, okay? And because of modern computer controls, you can take your handset and you know, put in your date, your location, whatever, and it will find things in the sky by their altitude and their azimuth address. Well, the nice thing about Schmidt cast grains is that you can configure them for an equatorial mount. You get a wedge, I have the Mead X wedge here, and it has a plate here that you adjust to your latitude, and this is permanently mounted, so I actually use an Ioptron camera to uh, orient it to the north celestial pole. I never have to touch this thing, I just turn it on and go where I want to go. But once it's mounted on a wedge, it has the equatorial function, okay? The azimuth now becomes right ascension, and the altitude now becomes the declination, okay? And without getting into a lot of detail, every object in the celestial sphere has an address. Just like on Earth, you can pinpoint any place on Earth by its latitude and longitude, okay? Well, on the celestial sphere, we have right ascension. That's basically the longitude. And we have declination, okay? That is the latitude. And so this can track things very, very precisely in equatorial mode. Okay, the pros of equatorial mounts. There's, huge, there's one huge pro here. It's because they are aligned with Earth's uh, ax, uh, axis of rotation. They can precisely track objects across the sky. And in fact, I've made the assertion here that if you want to be serious about pursuing astrophotography, a high quality equatorial mount is paramount in importance. It's probably more important than the telescope riding on the mount. That's how much I think of it. Cons of equatorial mounts, boy, there is a learning curve involved. 
Uh, you don't just wheel it out there and away you go out to do the azimuth there. You've got a pull line in it, and uh, there, there's, there's a little bit of a learning curve, and then there's a little bit of a setup time that's required when you use an equatorial mount. They're vastly more expensive than an outpass mounts. Um, eyepiece position can be awkward, depending on what you're looking at. Now, with an extended tripod, that can be mitigated a little bit. Uh, they do not perform well, listen to this, astrophotographers. If you're planning on using it for astrophotography, do not read the telescope mount's carrying capacity and believe it. You want to under, you want to over mount your telescope. Uh, because when you get up toward that capacity, it really strains the, the guiding. Okay, is anybody here thinking about buying a first telescope? Okay. Here are some things that are very important for you to know. How well do you know the night sky? And it's, it's nothing to embarrass you, it's just a very straightforward question, okay? How much do you know about telescope design? Now, hopefully after today, when you take my hand out, you know a lot more about telescope design, that might help you. How are you planning to use the telescope? Do you want something to use both terrestrially and celestially? Do you want to basically look at deep sky objects? Do you want to do astrophotography? The answers to all those questions will factor into your decision of which design you want to go after. Here is another big one. Where is your primary observing site? Now, I've watched my bountiful backyard deteriorate the quality of the sky over the years to where it makes me cry, literally. I love the night sky. I mean, I hope you can see that. I love the cosmos. And I've watched it go from where I can see the Milky Way, and it's, I think it's Bortle 6 now, Bortle 5 or 6, and it's just, it's, it's, not, it's not good. Uh, but it is what it is, and that's why a portable telescope is nice to have. How portable is your telescope? How portable does it have to be? Now, I'm 67 years old now, and I'm not as physically fit as I used to be, and all my sports injuries from when I was a young man are now coming home to roost. I got two bad knees, I got a bad wrist, and uh, I don't like lifting 60 and 70 pound telescopes anymore, okay? So, you know, those are things to consider. Here is the biggest uh, thing that I can say to you. Attend some star parties, look through different telescopes, talk to the people, ask them why they purchased the kind of telescope they did, and follow their advice. And the last one on there I skipped, but I didn't skip it. What's your budget? I mean, you can spend a little, or you can spend a whole lot. You know, it's just like automobiles, you know? You can buy a budget or you can buy a Lamborghini, you know? They both have four wheels, but you know, they're, they're different. Okay, where to purchase your telescope? Online stores. Some online astronomy stores actually offer a lot of support. And that is something to consider. Price isn't the only thing. I mean, when you can call somebody and ask them technical questions, and they have somebody there that knows what they're talking about, that's, that's something to consider when you make a decision. Of course, Amazon, members of SLAS. Uh, on our website, we actually have a classified section where you know, people can sell their gear. Local newspaper and TV station classifieds. The telescope in my observatory, I found on Craigslist. The guy who lived here locally had bought the Schmidt gas crane and taken it out of the box and set it up once and put it in the closet. It had never been used, and I got it for hundreds and hundreds of dollars less than I would have bought a new one. And uh, so keep on the lookout for stuff like that. Um, online sites, especially in, uh, specializing in used astronomy gear, there's a couple of them out there. And eBay, of course. Well, here's one of the star parties I had at my backyard observatory. These pictures here, I just invited people to put their cell phones up to the lens and take a snapshot. Those aren't stacked, those are single exposures, but that shows you what you can see through an eight inch cast frame from light polluted, bountiful Utah. Third skies, everybody.